The Deluxe Edition Network, also known as The Den, is an incredible podcast network that offers a wide variety of entertaining and informative podcasts. With a lineup of shows covering various topics, such as interviews with a wide variety of guests, history, music, relationships, true crime, and so much more. The Den provides content that caters to a diverse range of interests. The hosts and guests on the Deluxe Edition Network demonstrate a deep passion and expertise in their respective fields, making each episode on each show engaging and thought-provoking. The network fosters a sense of community by encouraging listeners to interact through live chats, social media, and forums, creating an inclusive environment for discussion and sharing opinions. With its commitment to high-quality production, the shows in the Deluxe Edition Network continue to captivate and entertain its ever-growing audience. Whether you're a podcast enthusiast or someone looking to explore new topics, The Den is a fantastic platform to dive into and uncover fascinating insights from experts in their fields. The Deluxe Edition Network is the home of independent awesomeness. To find all these great podcasts in one convenient location, head over to DeluxeEditionNetwork.com. That's DeluxeEditionNetwork.com. This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Everybody, welcome to Films and Fermentation, episode 137. That's right, we are Films and Fermentation, a movie and alcohol podcast. I'm Leo. Kevin. I'm Mike. We're three friends who like to talk shit about movies while getting <laughs> shit-faced. Tonight's episode, episode 137, is titled, You Can't Handle the Booze. <laughs> which is a play on words from the famous line from A Few Good Men, You Can't Handle the Truth. Because tonight, folks, the tonight, folks, we are going to prosecute and defend our favorite courtroom films. Will the crowd object to our arguments? Will they be sustained or overruled? Keep listening to find out. And that's about the extent of like court knowledge that I have to come up with a script. For that. <laughs> I object. I object. All my court knowledge comes from movies. <laughs> <laughs> All my court knowledge comes from Law and Order. Yeah, <laughs> all my knowledge comes from uh, Phoenix, uh, right? The video game. <laughs> I think you're gonna... All rise for the Honorable Judge Marshall Stevens. Honorable. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Oh, guilty, but with a real good excuse. They plead not guilty. The defendant is not guilty. You're the one who's guilty. I'm going to set your bail at three thousand dollars. Your bail is twenty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand dollar bail for fifty thousand dollars. Two thousand dollars and bail. Throw this jackass out of my court. Yes, Your Honor. Call the first witness. <laughs> I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So anyway. I truth. want the truth. You can't handle the truth. And the truth shall set you free. I know this isn't easy for you. What were these other photographs of, Mr. Burke? Is that a question? Did you say utes? Yeah, two utes. What is a ute? I am instructing my client not to answer that question on the grounds of self-incrimination. The prosecution is not going to get that man today. No. Because I'm going to get him. I object, Your Honor. 
This trial is a travesty. It's a travesty of a mockery, of a sham, of a mockery, of a travesty, of two mockeries, of a sham. I move we dismiss claim for damages on the grounds that those women were not here. Shut up. I don't want these two fellas pitching knuckleballs at me at the same time. I object, Your Honor. Sit down. Your Honor, I object. You would. Bastard. Hey. Move to strike that from the record, Your Honor. It's speculation. So stricken. Objection overruled. Overruled. To overrule the objection. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Now you may proceed, Mr. Beagler. Your Honor, I'd like to say a few words to the court, if I may. Now listen, this is a cross-examination of a murder case. It's not a high school debate. You play it. Come in here. Then you're just a bunch of lousy, yellow, stinking cowards. Sir, you're out of order. Order. Order in the court. Order. Order. Uh, Your Honor? Shut up! Right down, Mr. Vigoda. You're out of order. You're out of order! You're out of order! Is that justice? You must learn the law! What do you love about the law, Andrew? <laughs> I... <laughs> many things. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I know you've spent all morning listening to Mr. Broigo talk. I know you're hungry. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've heard a lot here today and I'm not gonna try to go back over it all again for you I'd hate to be in your shoes today you have a lot to think about you see much hidden evidence the American public has never seen if we are to have faith in justice we need only to believe in ourselves in the name of God do your duty have you reached a verdict we have, Your Honor. We find the defendant not guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant, Clay Shaw, not guilty. <laughs> So don't forget to drop us an email at filmsoffermentation at gmail.com or visit linktree.com slash films of fermentation on all of our social media and podcast links. Become part of the Films of Fermentation family by supporting us at Patreon or buying our merchandise at Teespring. Dot com. We are now part of the Deluxe Edition Network, The Den. Find out more about us and the other podcasts at the Deluxe Edition Network by visiting deluxeeditionnetwork.com. And our last episode, episode 136, the recasting of The Wizard of Oz, has entered into the top five of our most downloaded episodes ever. It is wow. n- number four on the list, knocking out the career of Ron Howard. <laughs> Ooh. Ron Howard uh, episode dropped to number six on our on our uh, list of downloaded episodes. Wow! Uh, number five, Mike is loudly remembering the Quiet Man. <laughs> Man that's the, it is, that one keeps it, fighting. <laughs> it's very close to getting knocked out of the top five. <laughs> wow! But yeah, so our last episode quickly became one of our most downloaded ones. Nice. So thank you out there to everybody who was supporting the show. Don't forget to mm-hmm. like, subscribe. And especially download your favorite episodes. What are we drinking tonight, gentlemen? Well, I'll go first. Go first, sir. Go first, Mike. I have all these little mixer bottles sitting around the house I need to get rid of. So since we're doing lawyers, courts, a lot of movies and shows have them southern lawyers. I'm starting my night off with a mint julep. (laughs) <laughs> I'll do the play off. I'll do that the play off. I'll the say, I'll say, I'll say. I'll 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 do, had. I'll do the play off. This court room sucks. <laughs> uh, I'll go next then because speaking of mixed drinks, I am drinking a tequila mockingbird margarita. <laughs> Ooh. Nice. So it's tequila, tequila, creme de menthe, and lime juice. Uh, mm. To give it a little minty flavor and a little bit of a green color, but it doesn't really look on the screen. It looks kind of blue, but it's a greenish color. <clears throat> That's what I'm drinking. Kev, what do you got going on? <laughs> so I wish I had followed a theme of some sort, but um, I'm going with two new ones. Uh, one my wife brought back from uh, Washington, D.C. on her trip most recently. I'll probably start off with that one. This is a cream ale by uh, Two Silos Brewing Company in Manassas, Virginia, okay? This is an American cream ale infused with raw clover, honey, milk sugar, orange peel, and natural vanilla flavor 
to create a velvety smooth, medium bodied and delectably delicious interpretation on this American classic. Uh, and best enjoyed fresh. And let me give you guys an ABV. 6% alcohol. By the so All right. that's, that's number one. <laughs> and I will be uh, following this with another sweet treat from our home. Well, my home state of uh, Pennsylvania. This is a victory tasty cake, coffee cake, <laughs> ale. Nice. Tasty yeah. cake. <laughs> tasty cake. For anybody yeah, not from the East Coast, that is a, an East Coast thing, man. Everybody loves the taste of a tasty cake. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but they went with the coffee cake and not the peanut butter. <laughs> this is good, but it's really um, light. You know, I, I, it's I not a went, strong flavor. I would have went with a tasty cake like crimpet. <laughs> yeah, or something. Crimpet or like, coffee a, cake, yeah. or like a, or like a lemon pie or something like that. Mm. <laughs> Um, I originally tonight was going to do something different for my drink. So the other, uh, I think it was the last show. I told you guys that Katie and I ordered from this company called Oak and Eaton that allows you to make your own bourbons. Right. Uh, so you pick out like the flavor and how you want it infused and all that. And so we, we got our bourbons the other night and I was going to, I was going to judge them on the show tonight. Uh, take a take a shot of each one and judge them. And I was like, you know what? If in case I don't like them, I don't want to do that live. <laughs> so I bring judge- them over tomorrow night so we can so, both taste them. Well, the I, I'll, I can take them over if you want and you can try them out. But I I judged them last night, mm-hmm. and uh, I wasn't like super impressed by it. Ooh. it was a it's a bourbon whiskey base, and then you pick an oak cork, like spiral cork, to go into the into the bottle. And that spiral quirk is dipped in a flavor that then infuses the whiskey. And so we had a Look coffee one. Service. We had a coffee one and we had a, a maple oh, one. Oh, whoa. What, what, what do you got pizza? there, sir? Uh, some whole pizza, pizza and french pizza? fries. Nice. Where's my pizza? <laughs> whoa, 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 the gentlemen whoa. are wondering where their pizza's at. Huh? I just, the boys I... want to know where their slices are. Oh, they're downstairs. <laughs> they're downstairs. downstairs. You guys know sorry. where the kitchen is. I'll come over later. <laughs> <laughs> um, I scarfed my dinner down before we start recording. <laughs> Hold on, let me transfer this to my phone so I can get in the car. Right. <laughs> we'll We've done shows on the phone before. We know how they turn out. We zoom it in from the phone. <laughs> I just bought a brand new, brand new mic so I could do it on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, so like the bourbons were okay. Like they had a little bit of the flavor of the infusion. I don't know if they need to air out a little bit more or something, maybe. But um. They they were okay. They weren't like the best they bourbon. Right a little bit more, you know, set for a little a bit. bit more infusion and um, like it's two different kinds of bourbons. One's like a straight bourbon, and the other one is a four grain whiskey. Um, so the four grain whiskey one was a little stronger. It burned a little bit, um, and the other one was a little smoother. But anyway, anything special happened this week, Mike? This day, or this week in film <laughs> history. This yeah. month in film history. I've only been 137 episodes. Mike, you'll get it right eventually. <laughs> well, we did start off as this day in film history. Just mm-hmm. moved up to it this week. So I, I'm, I'm going to lapse back to the old days every so often. Oh, so <laughs> in 1926, John Luggy Baird gives the first public demonstration of television in his laboratory in London. And the first uh, thing he sent was a uh, picture of a ventriloquist puppet just kind of like sitting there just to transmit the image. Uh, we learned about this uh, on the Giggle <laughs> episode of the Doctor Who 60th anniversary series <laughs> when, the, when the doctor took on the toy maker. That's the only reason I know this fact. <laughs> yeah. uh, what do you got next? In 1931. <clears throat> Cinemaron, directed by Wesley Ruggles, starring Richard Dix and Aaron Dunn, premieres in New York, the first Western to win Best Outstanding Production Picture in 1931. Yeah, so you want to do some potluck movies, Mike. You throw me a movie from the 30s, I probably haven't seen it. <laughs> I can throw some um, John Wayne's at you. <laughs> like, like a movie from the 30s, I probably haven't seen. Otherwise, I would have been really all over the fact that the guy, that actor's name is Dick Dix. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. 
the next fact I actually heard in school this week from uh, one of the teachers. In 1961, the first live national televised presidential news conference held by JFK. I actually think it was on Tuesday's date that the, the first uh, uh, live occurrence this past Tuesday. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. So today's the 26th, so, that, so we're recording on Friday the 26th, so this would have been uh, Tuesday the 20. So, or no, 24th, 24th, wait, 27, 26, 24th. Uh, 23rd, you're right. <laughs> Carry the <laughs> two, <25. laughs> Can't even do math for dates, this guy, Jesus. I, fuck, man, I told you, math is the reason I taught English for 20 years. Uh, what's our next fact there? 1940, The Grapes of Wrath, directed by John Ford and based on John Steinbeck's novel of the same name, starring Henry Ford and Jane Darwell, is released. Henry Fonda. Also the inspiration for the California Raisins of Henry the nineteen eighties. So I was gonna say you beat me to it. The 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 sequel came out in nineteen forty two. It was called The Raisins of Revenge. <laughs> and the last one. This one's for Lee. Yeah. Nineteen eighty four. Hulk Hogan defeats the Iron Sheik. Yeah, yeah. Shut. <laughs> I've, I've been drinking way too early in the night. Yeah, I can't even talk. The Iron Sheik to win the first World Wrestling Federation title at Madison Square Garden, New York City. Back then, it was the World Wide Wrestling Federation title, the WWWF. Yes. And do you know what move he used to beat the Iron Sheik, Mike? With that leg drop, wasn't it? No, it was not. He did not That's use it. the leg drop to win his first championship. He used a small package pin. It was a folding chair. <laughs> it was no. a small, small package right. pin small to win package. his first championship. Yep. Wow. I didn't even know that he knew how to do a small package. <laughs> and speaking of that, Mike, since you and I are both wrestling fans, do you know if Roman Reigns uh, retains the title at WrestleMania, he will beat Hogan's record for the second longest title reign in history? <laughs> so the Rock's going to stop that then, huh? <laughs> no, I don't think he's. I, I think it's a, a passing of the torch match. Now, I had heard Hulk Hogan had said it was an average size pin, not a small package. Pin. <laughs> not a small package? I, no, it's an average it was, size. It was a, cold it's inside. It's a well-sized pin. <laughs> it was a cold stadium. It was a cold stadium. A cold stadium. They had the air on high. Yes, cold stadium. It was New York this time of year. Yeah, it's cold. <laughs> you know, come on. Uh, you have any must-try beer? Craft destination for this evening, Mike. I have a must-try beer. This is Hazy O, Hazy IP from Dogfish. Head Craft Brewing, Milton, Delaware. O is for oats here. One of the ways brewers add the fluffy mouth feel to hazy, juicy IPAs is to smash ton with grains like flaky barley, flaked wheat, and yes, you guessed it, oats. Oats come in four, four forms, malted, rolled, naked, and milk oats. Oat milk. <laughs> the usual mango, pineapple, and pine are pine, on burgundy. Pine <laughs> aromatics dominate the aroma. Put the best part of the beer on your palate. There you go, boys. <laughs> Dogfish Head Brewery. We've all had Dogfish Head Brewery. Yes, we, we have. I don't think I've had the old, old hazy hazy IPA. No, I've, I've been to their brewery. It's not far from a favorite vacation spot of mine. It's in uh, Rehoboth, or at least it has multiple locations. But it's in one along the Delaware beaches, and um, I used to go down to Ocean City, Maryland. So, uh, good brewery, good, good, good beer. They are the uh, raging bitch uh, beer, aren't they? Yeah. All right. So the Oscars were announced this week. Uh, I'm just gonna blow through a few of these things real quickly because I started my my watch of Best Picture nominees and I'm trying to get through the list before the Oscars and so far I've seen a few of these so the Best Picture nominees this year are American Fiction which is definitely on my list it really sounds like a good movie Anatomy of a Fall which I don't know much about uh, Barbie which I've seen The Holdovers which I just watched recently and it is a really good movie really funny movie uh, kind of reminiscent of Dead Poet Society in a little way, and probably uh, Paul Giamatti's best performance he's ever had. It's a really, really good movie. 
Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon I have yet to see because I don't have eight hours to put aside yet to watch that film. Uh, I saw Maestro, which is the Bradley Cooper epic that he directed, wrote, and starred in. Um, good performances. The movie was a little little slow for me. I saw Oppenheimer. I think Oppenheimer's going to win. I actually hope it wins. I think it is the best movie of the year so far. Uh, I have not seen Past Lives or Poor Things yet. And the next one on my list is Zone of Interest because I knew nothing about this movie. And then after reading the description, I was like, I got to see this. Uh, Zone of Interest is about the, it's based on a true story. It's about the, the German soldier who ran the Auschwitz uh, uh, concentration camp. And the movie is about his, he and his family live on a villa right next to the concentration camp. So it's about like his family's life living next next to the next to Auschwitz. And it sounded really interesting after I read it. So I was like, that one I'm checking out too. Best actors are Bradley Cooper for Maestro, Coleman Domingo for Rustin, Paul Giamatti for The Holdovers, Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, and Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. Right now, I think Killian Murphy is is most likely going to win, but it's like between him and Paul Giamatti right now. Mm-hmm. Best actress is Annette Benick for Nyad, Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon. Sanja Huler for Anatomy of a Fall, Emma Stone for Poor Things, and Carrie Mulligan for Maestro. And right now, it looks like it's another two-horse race between Lily Gladstone for Killers and Emma Emma Stone for Poor Things. Best Supporting Actress is Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction, Robert De Niro for Killers of the Flower Moon, Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer, Ryan Gosling for Barbie, Mark Ruffalo for Poor Things. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. looks like the runaway winner for this category. And I think after all the years and all the work he's put in, he deserves finally to get an Oscar for his, his acting. Uh, and he was amazing in Oppenheimer. I thought he like stole the scenes that he was in. Uh, Ryan Gosling getting the only nomination for Barbie is kind of ironic because the movie is all about like the pa- taking the, down, the, taking down yeah. the patriarchy and neither Margot Robbie nor Greta Gerwig, the director, got nominations. <laughs> yep. <laughs> They got snubbed. Yeah. And I like that he pointed that out, you know? Yeah, he pointed it out. And he could have just st- been, oh, I'm grateful for this, but, like, yeah. Yeah, and and, and uh, keeping up with his uh, consistency at getting snubbed at the Oscars, uh, DiCaprio did not get a nomination for Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> Best Supporting Actress is Emily Blunt for Oppenheimer, Danielle Brooks for The Color Purple, America Ferreira for Barbie, Jodie Foster for Nyad, and Divine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers. Divine Joy Randolph should win. She stole the Holdovers movie. She was amazing. Uh, she is on currently on uh, Only Murders in the Building. She is the detective who shows up to try to oh, that help. Her? That's Divine Joy Randolph. Yeah, she is really, really good in the Holdovers. Mm. And for Best Director, Jonathan Glazer for Zone of Interest, Yorgos Lanthimos for Poor Things, Chris Nolan for Oppenheimer, Scorsese for Killer of the Flowers Moon, and Justin uh, Justine Triette for Anatomy of the Fall. Nolan is finally getting his Oscar. An Oscar that I think he's deserved for a few films that he's directed over the years. So mm-hmm. he's finally getting his Tenet. Oscar for Oppenheimer. Yeah. yeah. Tenet. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he probably deserved one for Dunkirk. Dunkirk was so fucking yeah, amazing. Dunkirk was so amazing. Gotten Dunkirk. All Should've right, but even more himself. importantly, even more important than the Oscars, the Razzies were nominated. Were, were announced this week as well. <laughs> Razzies given to the worst films of the year. Here are your Razzie nominees. And Leo has watched every one of them. I've watched a couple of them. <laughs> You'll see if you can guess which ones I've watched. Okay. Here are your worst picture nominees: The Exorcist, Believer. Expendables 4, Meg 2, The Trench, Shazam, you that one. Fury of the Gods, and Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. You watch <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. I have watched Winnie the Pooh. You watch the, uh, the Meg 2. I Meg watched two. the Meg 2 because I saw the Meg 1. I like the Meg. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Meg That is as actually all I've seen. I have not seen the other films. Okay. As much as I love the Expendable films and Kevin too, because we, we've seen all three of them together at the theater. I did not see The Expendables 4. I even forgot that, that came out. <laughs> Great comedy, you know, sit back, laugh your ass off comedy film. Here are your your actors nominated for Worst Actor of the Year. Russell Crowe for The Pope's Exorcist. Uh, I actually like The Pope's Exorcist. It was I thought it was a fun movie, and he gives the most over-the-top Italian accent I've ever heard in a film. 
<laughs> is it equal to that of Zeus from uh it was kind of like Thunder? his his Greek and his Italian accent are very similar to each other. The Italian accent was just a little more over the top because it was the whole movie. <laughs> He's like, I am a dinner pope as an extra sister. <laughs> uh Vin Diesel for Fast X, Chris Evans for Ghosted, Jason Statham for Meg 2, the trench, and John Voigt for Mercy. Worst actress nominees. This hurts my heart. Anna de Armas for Ghost It. Uh, although, having seen clips of the movie, it's not a good film from what I've seen. <laughs> Megan Fox for Johnny and Clyde. Sama Hayek for Magic Mike's Last Dance. Jennifer Lopez for The Mother. And Dame Helen Mirren for Shazam Fury of the Gods. <laughs> um, shouldn't this be Megan Fox because she acted? Yeah, she, yeah. she was in Expendables 4. Could have been for that, too. <laughs> Worst supporting actress, Kim Cattrall for About My Father, Megan Fox for Expendables 4. <laughs> She's a double nominee. Bai Ling for Johnny and Clyde. Lucy Liu for Shazam. Mary Stuart Masterson for Five Nights at Freddy's. And your worst supporting actor, Michael Douglas for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Mel Gibson for Confidential Informant. Bill Murray for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Frank Nero as the Pope in The Pope's Exorcist. And Sly Stallone for Expendables 4. Man, they really shit on a couple of these movies here. <laughs> I, lo- I love this one. Worst screen couple. Any two of the merciless mercenaries from the Expendables. <laughs> <laughs> Any two of the money-grubbing investors who donated $400 million for the remake rights to The Exorcist. Anna DeArmas and Chris Evans for flunking screen chemistry. Sama Hayek and Channing Tatum for Magic Mike's Last Dance, and Pooh and Piglet as the bloodthirsty killers in Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. <laughs> oh, Pig and Poo, Pig, Piglet and Pooh's going to win that one. Come yeah. On. <laughs> They're already making a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> and before we move on, I'll throw Kevin this fact that I saw earlier and I think he'll like about his favorite actress, Heather Graham. Heather Graham holds a, re- a special record, uh, Kev. She has the quickest sitcom to be canceled in the history of Hollywood. Mm, probably didn't, even know, probably didn't like... even know she was on a sitcom of her own. Two guys she's, and a girl in a pizza place? She starred in a sitcom called Emily's Reasons Why Not uh, that was aired on January 9th, 2006. The first mm-hmm. episode was received so poorly, the studio canceled it during the first commercial break. <laughs> and they never they never showed the second they episode. They never came back from the commercial break. <laughs> they came back Ow. from the break, but they never showed another episode of it. <laughs> so, Kev, you have wow. any beer news? Is good news for us? Today? I do. Beer news is good uh, this is going to make my uh, dear friend Leo a very happy, happy man. It's back. It's Sam back. Adams has brought forth the two, the 2023, because this, this is a little old, but that's mm-hmm. okay, uh, Utopia beer. Mm. You remember? <laughs> yeah. The you remember fondly? <laughs> the one we weren't allowed um, to taste because the alcohol content was so high? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go into that a little bit now. Uh, so it was introduced in 2001. It's released only every other year. Um, it has a alcohol content. It's illegal in 15 states. Let me go over the states um, <laughs> that it's illegal in. It's illegal in Alabama, oh. Arkansas, Georgia. Idaho, Missouri, Mississippi, Montana, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, South Carolina, Utah, Vermont, and West Virginia. And the reasons for this is... They don't want no Yankee beer. <laughs> well, one of them was Rhode Island. That's a... <laughs> They're all red states. <laughs> Vermont. Uh, it's 28% alcohol by volume. By that yes. time, it's not beer. That's that's downright <laughs> liquor. Yeah, it is uh, what they call an extreme beer, blended in multiple batches and aged in multiple types of barrels. Uh, 
Um, Utopia has always been aged in a charred whiskey cask. And uh, in 2023, in uh, November 2023, when it uh, was uh, released, um, the Sam Adams Brewers expanded the kind of barrels for more complex flavors. Um, so it's been bourbon barrels. They use scotch and peated whiskey barrels, uh, peated scotch barrels, uh, and add a wisp of smoke. Um they use flavors uh, uh, while like Ruby Port. Uh, I can't just say the name of that. Car Cavellos casks from Portugal. Does that sound familiar to either one of you? Um, yeah. Brewed in Ohio, aged in Pennsylvania, and blended in Massachusetts, and bottled in Delaware. So, you know, it's around. we have a little representation here. So, Mike, just um, so you know, like when Kevin and I were up in Boston, we did the tour <laughs> of the Sam Adams Brewery. And right. at the end of the tour, you get a tasting. And you're only allowed, in Ma- by Massachusetts law, so many ounces of alcohol per tasting, you know, because cause it can't go over a certain ABV. So we right. got three, like, small tasters of three different kinds of beer. And then they brought out the Utopia, which is so strong that you can't take a sip of it. You could just smell the bottle. <laughs> so we got to smell the bottle. It straight up smelled like maple syrup. Mm-hmm. So much so that the girl giving the tour says that she has a bottle at home that she uses on her pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what they quoted the price now when we were down there? I think it was, it was $250 five. for $250 a bottle. Yes, 240 think, now. So maybe, you know, the price is Or maybe down I was wrong. Maybe it was $150 a bottle or something. I know $240 it for a bottle of this. It, it was released yeah. on October 30th, just this past October. <laughs> uh, the bottle's 24 and a half ounces, and they suggest they recommend serving it at two ounces a portion at <laughs> room temperature in a snifter. So a sniffer, rather. Up. It's. Um... How long did they say they brew it for? Like seven years or something like that? Yes. I, I mean, mean it's, like, they, it's like fermented for like a really long time. Yeah. So that that uh, that makes sense that it's not being released again until like, you know, most recently, 2023. Yes. Probably not again uh, to 2020, 2030 or, <clears throat> or 2030. So or the, next batch after, the next batch will be released in late 2025. Oh, it's so like it's two far. years. They're doing two years, but I do believe that they they do age it for, like you said, like seven years, uh, and they just have it set up like this okay. is the twenty twenty five batch. Years. All right, right, right. right. So like on odd number <clears throat> years, they probably release it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Utopia. If anybody's looking out there to get a gift for your favorite host at Films and Fermentation, you could always <laughs> just buy Utopia beer. God knows I can't afford it myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. That brings us to our favorite segment. Synopsis according to Glip. Brought to you by Newsly.me. Newsly.me is an audio super app for iOS and Android that reads news to you in a natural human voice. Stop scrolling and start listening. Go to Newsly.me today and download the promo code N for men to get your first month premium subscription for free. Last week, we did our 136th episode. It was a recasting of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, we had a lot of fun during that episode. We came up with some really good uh, casting choices, I thought. Um, this is what Glip said the episode was about, though. Leo asks Mike about what happened this year. Mike tells him. <laughs> Leo is mixing his gin with Sprite because he's a classy guy. Kev Man tells us that beer news is good news. The participants are picking actors for The Wizard of Oz. Leo says they are not cowardly lions about it. Leo said Mike picked the Wicked Witch of Westeros to be the Wicked Witch of the West. Mike thinks Bruce has comedic chops, but Kev Man prefers John's ham. <laughs> <laughs> mm, John's, John's ham. ham. Leo wants Damn. Donald Glover in all his movies. That's the true. participants tried to decide where Christopher Walken would go. Leo Bruce wants Gin- <laughs> Leo wants Ginger in his gin- gin- in his gingham gown, and Kev Man wants a Dorothy actress who is guided by men. <laughs> Leo likes Mike and Kevin's choices more than his own. Again, another fairly accurate one, if not a little off the wall. Uh, oh, but, written oh, by a third man. grader. <laughs> so Leo asked Mike what happened this year. Mike tells him. <laughs> so, Mike, uh, that's all about Mike's this year in film history uh, segment. I mixed 
that overproof gin that Mike got me with some Sprite last week and got myself pretty fucked up. Uh, we added the beer news is good news segment last week that uh, Kev brought for us. And we recasted The Wizard of Oz. And I did say we weren't being cowardly about it. Uh, Mike did pick Lena Headey to be his Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, Bruce Campbell is the man with comedic chops. John's ham is actually John Ham. Uh, I do want Donald Glover in all my movies. We did have a little fun putting Christopher Walken into various roles in the film. Uh, the ginger in the gingham gown is my pick of Sadie Sink to play Dorothy. Yes. Uh, and Kev Man picked his actress because she's uh, used to being guided by men in her movies. Or something. I think it was what you said. I don't even remember how you said it. But that's what the clip I think you said. And uh, I did like some of your choices better than my own. In fact, I put our choices up on a poll on Twitter, Instagram, and was this Facebook. Yeah, Super Bowl. And uh, I asked everybody what they thought and who had the best results and uh, who had the best casting and all that. And uh, garnering roughly 55% of the vote after, like, adding it up across all the media, uh, Kevin had the the most uh, choices, the most votes. Mike and I split the other 45%, basically. Really? (laughs) Yeah. But, now, granted, the voting, the difference between numbers wasn't like extreme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they kind of added up. But uh, we did get a comment on Facebook by uh, Matt Lindsay uh, who wrote, Leo's picks for me. I was almost like, hey, Donald Glover should be the scarecrow. But then I saw you put Shooty Gutwa there and I was like, nice. But boo to Mike for saying ever that General Kenobi would lack courage. Boulder that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello of course, there. You of course picked uh, you and McGregor to be your cowardly line. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think he can play the part well. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was a funny comment. Thank you, Matt Lindsay, for your comment. Thank you, everybody who voted for uh, our last program, Thank and again, who helped me. us get that program <laughs> into our top five for most downloaded shows. Mike, what are you drinking now? I have now moved on to my whiskey sour with double shot of whiskey. <laughs> Here we go, guys. You're going for all the Southern courtroom drinks. Yes, sir. And uh, so Kevin uh, teaches a film theory class at his school and recently How about you too? <laughs> brought, brought his kids uh, the recasting Wizard of Oz question to see what they could come up with for the Wizard of Oz modern take. And I'm curious to hear what some of his students picked. Okay. So um, I'm going to say the one Dorothy Gale that really stood out to me. First and foremost, um, um, Millie, Bobby, Millie Bobby Brown was the like the go-to. That was resounding. Yeah. Uh, but the one that um, stuck out with, uh, with me <clears throat> was Storm Reed. If you're okay. familiar, she was in um, um, The Last of Us. She was in A Wrinkle in Time. Okay. Young Ameri- uh, African American actress, and mm-hmm. uh, just her appearance and her singing ability, I think she would make a uh, great Dorothy. She's um, the girl, the girl that um, Bella Ramsey's character uh, was like had a relationship with, or whatever, in the film in the Last of Us, right? Yes. She she gets killed in the mall. <laughs> mm-hmm. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> Spoiler. No, she's uh, I took the choice. Oh, yeah, it's funny because it's this. You cho- chose Bella Ramsey, so it's like a. Okay. And I chose Bella Ramsey, who was also <laughs> in The Last of Us. Yeah. yeah. Um, this one. Oh, this one was good for the Scarecrow. Uh, Lin Manuel. Hmm. Which I yeah. could see after watching that's, Hamilton. That's a really good one. Isn't that spot I, I saw on? There a couple lists out there, yeah. Yeah, it's a oh, spot on one. Like that's when I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little disappointed. I didn't figure that one. That's a really good one. Yeah, right. He could probably play any of those three roles. Yeah, any of the three companion yeah. roles. I think. Lim- but Lim- I Lim- think Brandon. his hey, just you know his what? lankiness and his yeah, you know, movability. Scarecrow. Yeah. Actually, mm-hmm. he's short enough to play Toto too. So <laughs> <laughs> you're not recasting Toto. It's too legendary. <laughs> Now, whereas um, he was my favorite, he was not by far the one that was picked the most. Uh, Jim Carrey was the one that many <laughs> students oh. had said would make for a good scarecrow. I'm surprised that many of your students, <laughs> you know, know who Jim Carrey is. At this point. <laughs> oh, funny. He popped up quite often. Um, 
I'd Just say when he was younger, mm-hmm. maybe because he was so rubbery and 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 agile and everything. I don't Flexible. know now. He's, he's almost sixty five now. I don't know if he can do it now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, Madonna's sixty five, and she's still touring apparently. <laughs> yeah, but that's Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's uh, um, I'm not going to get into the Tin Man, Tin Man. I mean, there were a couple of good suggestions for the Tin Man, um, but nothing that really stood out. Ryan Gosling came up. Okay, mm-hmm. I can see him as the Tin Man. He's got the I chops so, yeah. for the singing and the dancing. Um, but I'm going to jump to the Cowardly Lion because I had two which really stood out. Seth Rogen. Okay. As one of them. I could see that. It, him being the goofy, <laughs> you know, yeah. pilot that he is. <laughs> um. Or this one, Josh Gad. Who? Yeah, that's, Josh Gad. Josh. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's I've another really good one. Movies, so yeah. That's a really, really good one. I like him more than Seth Rogen, I think, for, for that role. <laughs> um, skipping over Glinda, there was somebody who had suggested, let me see if I can find that one really quick, um, that the... Uh, Glinda the Good Witch was actually portrayed by a guy named Jerry Trainer who was in iCarly. Um, oh, but he's yeah, also I know, been I know who he is. I know who he is. Yes. Yeah. They said his charm and humor would bring a different and playful vibe to the character. Uh, I can't I, speak to that. I don't know him, but I like I, that they were thinking outside the box with that. Knowing what I know about him, he'd be a good uh, scarecrow as well. Mm hmm. He's got that. Kind uh, of this mind. student also came up with, uh, and this is another one for the Cowardly Mind, Joe Pesci. <laughs> for Glenda? For the Cowardly Mind. No, no, no. For the Cowardly Mind. For the Cowardly Mind. I think, I think Pesci's a bit, Pesci's a my, bit old. My coward, do I amuse you? <laughs> Maybe the Wicked Witch. Put him up. Put him up. I'll shoot you in your face, you motherfucker. I, I didn't bite him. I didn't bite him. Don't make me keep my fucking fire monkeys on here. Why we king of the fucking forest? <laughs> um, and I mean, they, some had mentioned Angelina Jolie for the Wicked Witch of the West. Well, she did play um, what? Uh, she did Maleficent. play Maleficent. Maleficent. So. Yeah, right. So that kind of fits in there. Um, but I'm going to skip to the Wizard of Oz because there were two really good ones that I liked. Uh, well, I mean, three. Uh, there were many, but they're like. Um, one that got a couple votes was uh, Danny DeVito. <laughs> Danny DeVito for the wizard, uh, which I think was they're, they're basing that on him in in in, in the Big Fish. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> somebody had said if he was still alive, Robin Williams would make a good wizard, yeah, which I can still alive. Yeah, I, I stand behind that. He's you another know, one probably could have been any, any of the part. characters. Yeah, he could be yeah. Dorothy. <laughs> He could do the whole cast, the whole morning. (laughs) And then somebody had said, but they were torn between Christopher Walken and Morgan Freeman. (laughs) And then you played our clip of of Christopher Walken for them. (laughs) (laughs) Pay no attention to that man man behind behind the curtain. Uh oh, we uh oh, we oh, (laughs) (laughs) we're gonna take a quick break uh, for some promos. When we come back, we're going to go to our main segment. Our main segment tonight, we're looking at courtroom films. Uh, our lists are provided by IMDb. So we'll see you in a little bit. Face it, dating sucked in your 20s, gets worse in your 30s, and your 40s, forget it. It's a cesspool out there, and we're your flotation device. Join us weekly for saucy chat, ridiculous love gurus, and MILF-worthy fun to spice up your life. The MILF MILF and and Me Podcast. Podcast. Every Wednesday on your favorite pod platform. And the MILFandMePod.com. The MILF MILF and and Me Me Podcast. Podcast. Bev's Video Kingdom. Because the movies won't talk about themselves. So Andy crawls through this river of shit. He comes out, visits a dozen banks, and no one's like, I'm a little concerned about the guy in the suit. Right. It smells like shit. You mean, you mean, you mean the guy that literally washed himself in a river full of shit? And is supposed to sell it, smell good? Dude, that's completely the mall rat stink palm, which takes like three or four days to wash off. Oh, last time I scratched my ass, it smelled like Bigfoot's dick for a week. Bev's Video Kingdom. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Have you ever watched the news and wished that you could see something more positive or looked online and saw all the 
aggravation and anger and hatred out there and thought to yourself, why can't I just see more positive things in my life? Hi, I'm Mike Rathbun, and I'm the host of the Kindness Matters podcast. Every week, we promise to bring you stories that will uplift you and motivate you and inspire you to see the kindness and be the kindness that this world needs more of. Tune in, the Kindness Matters podcast with me, your host, Mike Rathbun. Uh, all right, so that brings us to our main segment. Uh, you can't handle the booze. Tonight we're talking about some courtroom films. So how we decided to do it tonight is instead of just uh, putting together a list like we normally do, we went with some uh, formal lists tonight uh, going through to IMDb and checking out some of the IMDb uh, user lists to see what that. other people out there had to say about this. So we have uh, two lists from IMDb, the 25 best courtroom dramas and the 25 best uh, or however many are on this list, the funniest courtroom drama or courtroom films. So we're looking at dramas and comedies. And then after we get through that list, I have an honorable mention for what I call the most batshit crazy law movie of all time, which we will take a look at at the end. Uh, so let's look at the, uh, the, the uh, dramas first. And we're going to take a look at what these uh, people voted for on IMDb and see if we agree with them or not, or what is the best film, uh, courtroom film of all time. So before we get to that, I did a Twitter poll earlier. Uh, and my Twitter poll was, what is the best courtroom film of all time? And the choices I gave them were My Cousin Vinny, uh, uh, A Few Good Men, Kill a Mockingbird, or Other. And Other, they would put in the comments of the question. You only do four four answers on the Twitter poll. Uh, right. And the majority of the votes went towards To Kill a Mockingbird as the best courtroom film of, of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, followed by My Cousin Vinny and then A Few Good Men. Which I can't argue with that too much. Uh, which should make those people happy because according to this IMDb list, To Kill a Mockingbird is the number one film. So um, I, I'm actually going to scroll down to the bottom and start from the bottom and work our way up. Let's do that. So we're going to go to number 25 here. They actually got 27 on this list. They Somebody do. must have added more. So number 27 on the list is The Firm, 1993, starring actually, Tom Cruise. Honorable. That's an honorable mention. These are honorable two. mentions, you think? That's what it says on, on, under them, too. Is it honor, oh, there you go. Honorable mention. The firm. A young lawyer joins a prestigious law firm only to discover that it has a sinister dark side. I really like this movie. I, I saw this in the theater. Um, it's an early, you know, like it's like Tom Cruise before he became the Tom Cruise we know today. Still mm. doing like a mix of different films. You have Wilford Brimley playing a this heavy. This was uh, the start of the John Grisham trend. In, yeah, this, in was the, this is an early John Grisham film. It only has a 6.9 on IMDb, which I'm shocked by. I thought it would have been a little higher. but You know, it um, doesn't have much in the courtroom, though. I mean, it's a lawyer, and it's all law-based, but there's not a lot of in-the-courtroom kind mm-hmm. of scenery. I mean, that could be why it's so low on this list, because it, you know we're mm-hmm. talking about films that are actually like courtroom-based, yeah. uh, which which brings us to our next honorable mention, which is the Lincoln lawyer starring uh, Matthew McConaughey. A lawyer defending a wealthy man begins to believe his client is guilty of more than just one crime. Uh, I am not, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with it, but I have not seen the Lincoln lawyer. Now a television series. It has a television yes, series. Yes, it now? is. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yep, I forgot about that. that. I've heard good things about this film, but I've not actually seen it. So Mike, you can um, just throw that into the potluck if you want. Yeah, I want to bring the two that I have. <laughs> Um, as honorable mentions to this list, then um, okay. I want to bring in Murder in the First okay. with um, Christian Slater, Kevin Bacon, and Gary Oldman. Bacon. Uh, <laughs> an eager, idealistic young attorney defends an Alcatraz prisoner accused of murdering a fellow inmate. The exigent circumstances: his client had just spent over three years in solitary confinement. I, I think I'll, it's one of be- Kevin Bacon's best roles. I'll be honest, when you said that earlier for a minute, I got confused. I'm like, why does he want to put this movie? I was thinking of uh, Murder at 1600 with Wesley Snipes. Yeah, no. And I was like, one. wait, that's not a court film. Why does he want to put that on? <laughs> no, 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 no. Murder, yeah. What was the other one? And I got about? confused and I thought it was Murder by Numbers. <laughs> uh, the other one is Just Cause, starring Sean Connery, Lawrence Fishburne, uh, Kate, uh, Kate Capshaw, Blair Underwood, 
Scarlett Johansson, Ed Harris, you know, all star mm-hmm. cast. Um, this one is a Harvard professor is lured back into the courtroom after 25 years to take a case of a young black man condemned to death for a horrific murder of a child. Mm. Heavy both of these, I thought, yeah, but both of them were very good movies, I thought. Um, yeah. Just Cause has a 6.4 on IMDb, when Murder in the First has a 7.3. Mm. So. <clears throat> so, I uh, I like Just Cause. Murder in the First, I've, I think I've only seen once. So. <laughs> I thought it's a, it's a different take on a courtroom movie. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you know you're, it's not saying that he's innocent, it's saying you guys created a murderer. Yeah. That, that, that this prison did so. I thought, and I thought Kevin Bacon was incredible in that movie. Bacon, Bacon. <laughs> Bacon. So the first movie on this list, and it's not considered an honorable mention, then is a Cry in the Dark from 1988. It is a film starring Meryl Streep, Sam Neill, and Dale Reeves. It's a mother whose child was killed in a dingo attack in the Australian outback. <laughs> Fights to prove her innocence when she is accused of murder. I think you like my baby. Yeah, I think that's where it comes from. <laughs> yeah, I think I like my baby. Kevin, what can't Kevin's what? Like, I'm not joking this time for once. What? Yeah, I know. <laughs> but Kevin actually had a fact that was right. <laughs> I think that's the only thing that really come out of that film. <laughs> it's a lesser known Meryl Streep uh, movie. And the yeah. Seinfeld skit, maybe the yeah. dingo eat your baby. Maybe. But it's like, <laughs> what can she do? She can even play an Australian. <laughs> I thought she was the dingo. Yeah. <laughs> she probably did both roles for all I know. Uh, I have never seen a cry in the dark. It's actually like just just think knowing that now though, like I think I kinda wanna check it out. <laughs> just for that thing. <laughs> Uh, I have seen the next one on the list, number 24, The Accused. Uh, After a young woman suffers a brutal gang rape in a bar one night, a prosecutor assists in bringing their perpetrators to justice, including the ones who encouraged and cheered on the attack. Uh, This got Jodie Foster her first Oscar for Best Actress in 1989. This is a 1988 film. It's a very good movie. Hard movie to watch. Hard movie to watch. Yeah. Heavy, heavy film. Uh, it's weird because Kelly McGillis is actually the lead in the film. She's first billed, but Jodie Foster won the Oscar for Best Actress for that movie, not even supporting an actress. Um, but yeah, good movie. Um, when we get to a few more of these on the list, we can start talking about whether or not some should be higher than others. Right now, The Accused is at 24. So let's Probably see what else we higher. got here. Might, might, might need to be higher. We'll see what else we got on this list. Uh, next one is the accused. After he's the rainmaker, Matt Damon, Danny DeVito, Claire Danes, and John Voight. An underdog lawyer takes on a fraudulent insurance company. This is another Grisham, uh, yep. uh novel uh, turned into movie. Uh, this is uh one that gets uh I feel it's kind of like forgotten. It's the early yeah. film for for Damon, but it's actually a really good movie. Um, this is kind of like I think post. Is this post Goodwill Hunting? It's like right yeah, after like Goodwill Hunting. I think he had just done Goodwill Hunting like a year before this. And so this is like the start of, of the Damon career. Mm-hmm. So that is number 23 on the list. I think that one's in a good spot, though. Yeah, I think just, just looking at some of the ones that are coming up. Uh, a Time to Kill. Uh, another Grisham. Another Grisham turned into film, uh, directed by Joel Schumacher, oddly enough. <clears throat> Uh, you look at this and you look at Batman and Robin and you're like, how the fuck are these directed by the same guy? He was good with drama. He was mm-hmm. not good with anything big, else. Like big budget, you know, right. studio right. films he like that. Good, right. This is uh, McConaughey again, Sandra Bullock, Sam Jackson, and Kevin Spacey. It's an early film for McConaughey, very early film for Sandra Bullock. She was just coming off the of speed and uh, uh, um, what was the other one she was in that year? Demolition Man, I think, was right right before this as well. So this is like yeah. early for Sandra Bullock. This is one of the... <laughs> I hate saying it because it, it kind of diminishes what the movie is about because the movie is a pretty heavy film. But it it's probably the hottest she's ever looked in a movie. <laughs> I think this is one of the best um, 
courtroom movies out there. I really I like agree. Courtroom. I'd agree. I, I think, think, it's I think very point two is way too low for that movie. Yeah, I think it's a really low score for it. Seven point five on IMDb, which is pretty good rating, but it's it's voted at number twenty two. It wouldn't yeah. be higher than other films just based on the rating itself. Yeah, I saw this movie twice in the theater. That's how much I liked it. I think I saw it with a group of friends, and I went back and saw it by myself because I was like, I really thought it was a really good, really good movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very early role for Sam Jackson as well. Um. Kevin Spacey at his slimiest <laughs> before the real life stuff that made him even slimier. Kevin McConaughey. Yeah, Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey is the, the only thing that kind of sticks out in that film for me a little bit is McConaughey. Because <laughs> this is before McConaughey was an Oscar winner and serious actor. He was uh, then, a very serious actor in that one, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. This was a, it's a really good movie. Time to Kill is a really good movie. Should be higher on the list, I think. And I love where Matthew McConaughey was like, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. How does your uh, defendant plead? How do we all plead? <laughs> when I sit here in my Lincoln, I think to myself, what is guilty? What is not? <laughs> Do I just object to life? <laughs> uh, the next one is, I love this fucking movie. Uh, I actually just saw this for the first time within the last year. And have already watched it twice since then. It's And Justice for All. It's very early Pacino. It's 1979. So he's coming off a run in the 70s of doing The Godfather, The Godfather 2, Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon, Panic in Needle Park, and this film. I mean, he, right. had, he had a hell of the 70s. Is a lawyer forced to defend a guilty judge while defending other innocent clients and trying to find punishment for the guilty and provide justice for the innocent? What's interesting about this film is it's not like, you know, you see these like big courtroom films, and it's always like the lawyer is defending one person. They only have this one client that they have to worry about. This one actually shows the like day to day life of an assistant assistant district attorney, where he's defending multiple clients in one day. You know, and then some of them are innocent, some of them are guilty, and he's you know going back and forth between these cases. And then in the meantime, he's forced to defend a judge that he knows is guilty of the crime, but his like job depends on it because the judge is so corrupt. He's like you know. He doesn't like him, so he makes him his lawyer to kind of force him to do it. It's a really, really good movie. And it ends with one of the best Al Pacino overacting performances of all time. <laughs> I'm out of order. You're out of order. This whole courtroom's out of order. <laughs> Ooh-ah. Yes, it was a very, it's like, great ass. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was, like, a very early version of what he would go on to do in scent of a woman <laughs> it's like you see him in the court scene in scent of a woman in this movie and it's you can see the seeds being planted for that performance i really like this movie it should be higher on the list too uh higher than 21 brings us to aaron brockovich at number 20 an unemployed single mother becomes a legal assistant and almost single-handedly brings down a california power company accused of polluting a city's water supply now, is this one a courtroom one, per se? Like, there's some court in it, but I don't know if this one is as much about the court as it is about her. Oh, uh, there's a lot of, like, legal but she's research. A yeah. She's a paralegal. She does a lot of research. She does a lot of um, meetings with the other lawyers. I don't know if it actually ever gets to court because there's a lot of settlement, like, going on. Yeah, between. it's a lot of, like... Uh, yeah, like you said, a lot of research, a lot of settlement, a lot of like interviewing clients and stuff like that. It's, it's like a lot of like the back, the back behind the scenes stuff that happens. Yeah, to it's kind of like stuff. it's the work that a lawyer would have to do before going to court, basically. Um, but she and would never go to a true story. Yeah, but she wouldn't go to court anyway because she's the paralegal. Like she's right. gathering information for the lawyer, uh, who's played by Albert Finney in the movie. Uh, right. It's a good movie. It's an Oscar-winning performance for Julia Roberts. I would maybe put it lower on the list only because it's not in the courtroom. Like I'm looking at like right. some movies that are like in the courtroom. So I would mm-hmm. maybe put maybe a time to kill there, at least something a little bit higher that way. 
Uh, number 19, I'm going to skip because that is my honorable mention for most batshit crazy court movie of all time. And I want to save that <laughs> for the batshit <laughs> courtroom movie. So we'll get to number 19 later. Uh, number 18 is Michael Clayton, George Clooney. Uh, Oscar winning performance by Tilda Swinton, as well as Tom Wilkinson and Michael O'Keefe. A law firm brings in its fixer to remedy the situation after a lawyer has a breakdown where representing a chemical company that he knows is guilty in a multi billion dollar class action suit. Uh, this is one of Michael or George Clooney's better performances. Uh, very serious film. Tilda Swinton's amazing in it. Uh, it was kind of a surprise Oscar winner, but pretty deserving of it for her performance. Uh, it's at number 18. I would say it's probably possibly something that needs to go a little higher on the list, but we'll see what else we got on here. Look at this, number 17. Miracle on 34th Street from 1947. Excellent courtroom scene. Excellent courtroom scene. Yeah. And it's, mm-hmm. You don't think of it. And I love this Christmas movie. Film, but, mm-hmm. I love this movie. I know. I you guys not. voted this as the number one Santa Claus movie. And <laughs> I'm going to say... I don't think it should be this high. Um, more I think it's, it's, I think it's fine not, where it's at. I don't want it lower. It doesn't need to be higher. I think it's okay. Well, there's some other movies that should be definitely <laughs> higher than it is on that we've already gone I think through. if I were going to knock it down again, I'd probably put Time to Kill a little higher, Justice for All a little bit higher, mm-hmm. maybe The Accused a little bit higher, uh, and maybe Just drop because, that one a few spots. Not too low. The whole movie's not about the courtroom. It's it's just got a courtroom. Oh, well, half of the movie is, and it's it's the legal system. It's you know the courts versus Santa Claus. Yeah, it's a good portion of you know? um, I yeah. mean, it's, it's the whole third act. So I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it, the whole it's, third it's, act mm, <laughs> more than Aaron Brockovich had. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I didn't now, say much about hers either. But, but some of these other ones, it's the whole act. The whole yeah. you're telling me, oh, if, if you were telling me that if it was uh, Miracle Thirty Four Street, the remake, I would say fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but, good question. Which but one had a better close? Uh, which one had the better closing argument for the um, climax? It was the original? The one. remake, where it was the dollar bill, yeah, or the original, the original? Yeah, the original with the government agency. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. I had the best. Yeah. I thought. Uh, next film is another like tough film to watch, man. <laughs> it's uh, Daniel Day Lewis, Pete Postlethwaite, uh, in the name of the Father. Came out in 1993. Uh, I saw this in the theater when it came out. An Irishman's coerced confession to an IRA bombing he did not commit results in the imprisonment of his father as well. Meanwhile, a British lawyer fights to clear their names and free them. It's intense. It's it's it's. I think it's based on a true story. So he's he's framed for this IRA bombing uh, and forced to confess to it. Uh, and so, in being coerced into his confession, they bring his father into it too. And his father, he and his father, both get imprisoned for a bombing that neither one of them committed. The father ends up dying in prison before they can prove his innocence. It's fucking brutal. <laughs> and then I, I heard right that he had to practice painting with his feet for this role. This yes, for my left foot he did that. Yes. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Wrong. Movie. For my left foot, he learned how to paint with his foot. Yes. <laughs> uh, in his short career. Daniel Day-Lewis won three Oscars and was nominated for almost every single performance that he's ever done, including this one. He didn't win for this, but he was nominated. It's because he wasn't painting with his feet. He, wasn't painting. he did win an Oscar for painting with his foot. Uh, the next one, I forgot that this is a court movie. <laughs> is it actually a court movie? It's, it's a court movie, yeah. I mean, it's about the trial of Sir Thomas More. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's the story of Sir Thomas More, who stood up against King Henry VIII when the king rejected the Roman Catholic Church to obtain a divorce and remarry. It's basically like the kangaroo court. Like, he's on trial to defend himself, but he's guilty no matter what anyway. And yeah, because the king's going to make you guilty. The king's going to make you <laughs> guilty anyway, and, and the priests who work for the king and all that stuff. But it's it's an amazing movie. It's Paul Schofield, Wendy uh, Wheeler, Wendy Robert Shaw. Paul Schofield won an Oscar for Best Actor for this. It's a really, really good movie. 
And I kind of forgot, like, yeah, like, if you don't think of it, cause it's like not the court you're used to seeing in films because it's, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it was, the 16th century or something like that. So, it, it, yeah, Damn of course, well, it's a really, really good movie, Man for All Seasons. Uh, the next one, I don't know this one. Uh, it's an Australian film, which could be why. Mm. Called, uh, number 14 on the list, Breaker Morant from 1980. Three Australian lieutenants are court-martialed for executing prisoners as a way of def- deflecting attention from war crimes committed by their superior officers. Uh, the dingo ate our superior no, officers! <laughs> yeah, I can't say anything about this film because I've never seen it. I, I've never even heard of it. Breaker Morant. It's an Australian uh, it was the dingo ate our prisoners! Yeah. Uh, I don't know why this is on the list of dramas, uh, but My Cousin Vinny is number 13 on this list of courtroom dramas. It's not much of a drama. It's not a drama. Whoa, whoa, whoa. A His comedy. cousin was being framed for murder. I, I was going to say there was the, murder on the table. It's the, the murder murder. The crime to murder murder is it's such a heavy crime that they're being convicted of. Uh, you know, I guess that's maybe why. But I wouldn't put this on a list of, of dramas. Like I no, would take this no. take this one off and and you know maybe put like a few more up a few few notches. Yep. Uh, but we'll talk about My Cousin Vinny anyway, because that is on the courtroom comedy list. Oh, uh, fucking number 12 is awesome. Primal Fear is a good fucking movie. <laughs> it it should be up this high on the list. Primal Fear yeah. uh, it stars good. Richard Gere, Laura Linney. It's Edward Norton's first performance, and he got an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor for it. Amazing twist ending. Uh, an altar boy is accused of murdering a priest, and the truth is buried several layers deep. He seems like he has multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder as they call it now uh Mm -hmm. but therein lies the mystery it's one of richard Gere's best performances and Mm -hmm. edward edward norton is fucking amazing in this film so primal fear number 12 that i think should be there the next one i think should be higher I think it should be at least in the top 10. Yeah, yeah I think at least in the top 10. And it's not uh, just because we're all from around that yeah, area. Yeah, and it's not just because of our, our relationship to the city that the movie's named after. Mm-hmm. Number 11 is Philadelphia, which came out in 1993, starring Tom Hanks, Denzel Washington, Roberta Maxwell, and Buzz Kilman. Uh, Tom Hanks won his first Oscar for Best Actor for this film. A man with HIV is fired by his law firm because of his condition. He hires a homophobic small town lawyer as the only willing advocate for a wrongful dismissal suit. Uh, I kind of argue. It's heartbreaking. It's a heartbreaking movie. I kind of argue that Denzel Washington is the star of this film now. Yeah. (laughs) No, this is all. I mean, I know Tom Hanks is the one that won the Oscar for it, and and his performance is what steals the show, but it's kind of about Denzel Washington's journey from being somebody who's afraid of his client to kind of like, Becoming friends with him to really caring for the guy by the end, and mm-hmm. helping him helping him win this case and becoming a better lawyer and all that. Fucking such a good movie, man! I had to watch this again. Yeah. For, it's one of those like a really sad movie and a tough movie. Yeah, tough, sometimes it'd be a t- it can be tough to get through. It's a tough watch, man. But for something about it, makes it like a movie I can rewatch. Right, as opposed to something like um. Like the accuse, like the accuse is <laughs> fucking tough to watch more than once. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this one I can watch a lot, man. It's just because the performances are so good in it. Yeah, uh, it's also the first American film for Antonio Banderas, who plays Tom Hanks's uh, 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 it's partner a, in the film. Yeah, it's his first. What year did um, Interview with the Vampire come out? Uh, mm-hmm. Might have been the same year or the year after. Okay. Um, but this is his first American role. Okay. Next one is In Cold Blood, starring Robert Blake, Scott Wilson, John Forsyth. This is based on the book written by Truman Capote, based on his interviews uh, with this murderer. Uh, two ex cons murder a family in a robbery attempt before going on the run from the authorities. Police try to piece together the details of the murder and attempt to track down the killers. The oddest thing about this film is that Robert Blake would then later go on to be put on trial for killing his wife. <laughs> True enough. Uh, I have not, not seen In Cold Blood, so I can't really say much about this. 
I can say something about number nine, a movie that definitely deserves to be in the top ten. Inherit the Wind. Based on the real-life case, the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925, two great lawyers argue the case for and against a Tennessee science teacher accused of the crime of teaching evolution in the classroom. Stars Spencer Tracy, Frederick March, Gene Kelly, and Dick York. This is a great film based on an amazing play. Uh, it was one of my favorite books to read in, in school. It was one of my favorite books to teach. It's, it's, it's an awesome story. Inherit the Wind definitely deserves to be in the top ten. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Strange not to see Gene Kelly in a dancing number, though. I know, right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, yeah. But it's, you never, it's what you never saw the Three Musketeers with Gene Kelly. <laughs> Did he dance in that one? No. Are you sure? He, I he thought there was a the tango door. scene. No, no tango. There was scene. definitely a tango scene. A tango scene. There was. There was a rose in the mouth. I think you're thinking of. Uh, are you thinking of Zorro? <laughs> oh, no, that's right. That's right. And that and was Antonio Banderas. <laughs> yeah, the next one is definitely a uh, another top ten uh, courtroom film, Kramer versus Kramer, nineteen seventy nine. After his wife leaves him, a work obsessed Manhattan advertising exec is forced to learn long neglected parenting skills. But a heated custody battle over the couple's young son deepens the wounds left by the separation. This film won a, an Oscar for Best Picture. It won Meryl Streep an Oscar for Best Actress. Uh, I think the director won the Oscar that year as well. It's it's another intense movie, another one that's kind of hard to rewatch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I put it up there with like the the newer one with the Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson Marriage Story. Mm-hmm. It's a very very similar track, uh, yeah. but it's a really good movie. <laughs> the Verdict with Paul Newman. Tell me, either of you guys have seen this one? No, I have not. No. Oh. Put it on your list. Good movie. Uh, an Think outcast. Be another movie for that new potluck. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be your potluck movie. An outcast, <laughs> alcoholic Boston lawyer sees the chance to salvage his career and self-respect by taking a medical malpractice case to trial rather than settling out of court. Stars Paul Newman, Charlotte Rampling, Jack Warden, James Mason, 1982. One of Paul Newman's best performances. Uh, I think he was nominated for it. It's it's a really good movie. I. I recommend checking it out now we get to our top six here i'm already going to say that number six needs to be higher <laughs> you need me on that, that wall. wall you want you me, me on, on that, that wall, wall. <laughs> who's going to rip do off it? your head pull out your eyes and piss in your skull or something like that <laughs> who's going to do it you you lieutenant weinberg <laughs> <laughs> You sleep under the very blanket of freedom that I provide, and then you question how I provide it. I'd rather you just say thank you and went about and went about your business. That's not even the best line in the movie. The best line in the movie is before the trial, when they they meet him on the beach in 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 Cuba, and he's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> "I tell you, there's nothing like a blowjob from a superior officer." But now that I'm a corp a colonel, I'm going to have to wait for some broad to become president. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jack Nicholson. <laughs> One of his best performances as well. So if you haven't guessed it yet, we're talking about A Few Good Men from 1992. Military well, lawyer like Lieutenant that. Daniel Caffey defends Marines accused of murder. They contend that they were acting under orders. One of Tom Cruise's best performances. Uh, Jack Nicholson, Oscar nominated for this role. Any other year he would have won, but this year he went up against uh, Gene Hackman in Unforgiven. And Gene Hackman took the Oscar. Uh, Demi Moore, Kevin Bacon's in this. Kiefer Sutherland has a role in this. Um, uh, no Wiley. No Wiley in Junior. it. Uh, Kevin Pollack is the other, um, uh, the other lawyer on the on on uh, Tom Cruise's team. It's a great movie, directed by Rob Reiner, one of his best films. Uh, I can't say enough about this movie. I think it definitely needs to be higher on the number six. What's this yeah. written by? Um... Aaron Sorkin. It is written by Aaron Sorkin, yes. Yeah, you can tell by the dialogue. Yeah, you can tell by the dialogue. It's a Sorkin film. A few Good Men, for me, is probably uh, my, top, my top three. Two. My top three, if you include comedies in the list, uh, 
To Kill a Mockingbird, My Cousin Vinny, and A Few Good Men are my top three. Mm-hmm. I love A Few Good Men. Um, Witness for the Prosecution is number five on the list, 1957. Tyrone Power, Marlene Dietrich, a veteran British barrister, must defend his client in a murder trial that has surprise after surprise. The older you get into Hollywood films, the less likely I may have seen it. I have not seen Witness for the Prosecution, so I can't really say right. much on this. Uh, Anatomy of a Murder, 1959, with James Stewart. James Stewart again. Jimmy. Jimmy Stewart. An upstate Michigan lawyer defends a soldier who claims he killed an innkeeper due to temporary insanity after the victim raped his wife. What is the truth, and what will win his case? This is a good movie. Uh, a, a crazy subject matter for 1959. Uh, you know, it's kind of kind of bold for a 19 for a film from 1959. But it's a Jimmy Stewart Jimmy film. It's a good film. It's a good film. Judgment at Nuremberg, number three, 1961. In 1948, an American court in occupied Germany tries four Nazi uh, judged for war crimes. The Spencer Tracy film, Burt Lancaster, Richard Widmark, another really good film. It's also a good uh, war film as well as a courtroom film. Just think what that kind of movie like that would be like made today. Mm. That would be a rough movie. (laughs) <laughs> It'd be a rough movie to make, but I, I see it being made today. No, I mean, I'm just there's saying, been some pretty rough they, war films. <laughs> but I'm just saying, back in 1961, they kind of softened some of the stuff up. Yeah. Be this surprised. Would be... it's, it's still a good movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is a good movie. I, 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 I've seen it. Mm-hmm. Number uh, two is another amazing film. Definitely yeah. should be in the top five. Uh, mm-hmm. 12 Angry Men from 1957. Sorry, Henry. <clears throat> Honda, Lee J. Cobb, Martin Balsam, and John Fiedler. The jury in the New York City murder trial is frustrated by a single member whose skeptical caution forces them to more carefully consider the evidence before jumping to a hasty verdict. This is an interesting one because now you're seeing it from the jury's point of view. Right. Mm-hmm. The majority of the film takes place in the jury room as these 12 men argue with each other over whether or not this young man is guilty. Um, there was a remake. Uh, in the 90s, starring Jack Lemmon and George C. Scott uh, and a host of other actors that was, as far as remakes go, was a really good remake of the film. Uh, followed the same story, but was a little more of a modern you know, take on it. And number one, as we already said when we started this, is to kill a mockingbird. Uh, I am not going to argue that. I think Kill a Mockingbird no. is the I'll best yeah. courtroom film I've ever seen. You know, you're talking about a man who's kind of reluctant to to defend this guy, but does it anyway. Atticus Finch, a widowed lawyer in Depression Era, Alabama, defends a black man against an undeserved rape charge and tries to educate his young children against prejudice. It's another sad film, you know, because it doesn't really end the way you hope it will, but amazing performance from Gregory Peck. Uh, Even the little kids are great in it. It's the uh, Mm -hmm. debut performance of Robert Duvall as Boo Radley. In a, in, a, in a non-speaking role. Uh, man, if you've never seen To Kill a Mockingbird out there in uh, podcast land, you are sleeping on a classic. Just go out and see this movie. Well, you don't have to go out. Honestly, you can probably get it at You can probably get it on, on uh, you know, it's, it's on Prime Video. I don't know if there are any theaters still showing it right it's now. For, it's for rent or buy on Prime Video. Rent or buy on that. Prime Video right now. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you want to see any movie, if you haven't seen any movie on this list, at least see To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm. So that brings us to our little comedy list here. Uh, this is a shorter list. We'll fly through this one probably. Uh, starting from the bottom, this is only 16 films on the comedy list. I feel like it's hard to make a courtroom comedy. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of limited. Not for Paulie Shore. Not for Paulie Shore. Jesus. Is that on this list? Please tell me it is. <laughs> just, like, just so I can shit it on it, I want it to be on this list. I don't think it is. I'll, yeah, it is. It is? No, it's not. Is it? No, nope, no. Jury not, duty no. is the name of the film, but it's, I don't see it on here. I don't see it either. Um, <laughs> did you see that he had the balls to make a fake trailer of him playing Richard Simmons in a Richard Simmons yep. biography? And Richard Simmons says, nah. Richard Simmons came out and he's like, I didn't authorize it. I'm not doing any biographies about my life. This has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Uh, number 16 on the list, Legally Blonde 2, Red, White, and Blonde. This is how hard they're scratching to get comedies on this list, because this 
shouldn't be on any list. <laughs> <laughs> Got a 4.8 on IMDb. Uh, number 15, Trial and Error from 1997, starring uh, Kramer. Is that, is that Kramer? It's Kramer. Michael Richards Kramer. and Jeff Daniels. And Charlize oh. Theron's in this film. Oh. An actor poses as a lawyer to help a sick friend and problems How old is she, like, seven? 1997. This is early for her. She had just did, uh, she was in that thing you do in the 90s as well. That was her first movie. Hmm. Legal Eagles, 1986. With oh, Robert Redford, Deborah Winger. Movie. Yeah, that's a that's a good. This is one that should be on a list of comedy courtroom films. It should probably be higher than fourteen. It probably should be higher than fourteen. Should definitely be higher than B movie. Exactly. How the fuck did that end up on here? God <laughs> knows. B movie is the animated film with Jerry Seinfeld voicing a B. It is. <clears throat> then they right. need to defend themselves <laughs> to keep the bees going. Yeah, because she has a relationship with the B. It's really weird. They're uh, taking my honey! No, I'm taking that movie off the fucking list and moving Legal Eagles up. Yeah. He got Trial and Error from 1962. Peter with Sellers. Peter Sellers. Sellers. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting if Peter Sellers is in it. Mm-hmm. An incompetent barrister is assigned to defend an accused wife murderer. <laughs> Ted 2. <laughs> <laughs> Ted Sue actually is a court film. It's a he's defending his right to uh to get married because he's trying to to prove that he's a sentient being. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that episode of Star Trek, Mike, where Data has to prove that he's uh, sentient so he doesn't get taken apart. <laughs> Newlywed couple Ted and probably Sammy not, Lynn. Probably not nearly as good as that. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a pretty funny fucking movie. Newlywed couple Ted and Tammy Lynn want to have a baby, but in order to qualify to be a parent, Ted has to prove that he's a person in a court of law. What does he end up making his name? Uh, oh, his 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 legal uh, last name is uh, Clubber Lang. So his name is Ted Clubber Lang. <laughs> <laughs> legally Blonde is number 10. See, I would, yes, I would definitely put the first Legally Blonde on this list before I put Legally Blonde 2. <laughs> <laughs> Elle Woods, a fashionable sorority queen, is dumped by her boyfriend. She decides to follow him to law school. While she is there, she figures out that there is more to her than just looks. The movie that made Reese Witherspoon a megastar. Legally Blonde. Uh, I don't know the next movie on the list. Number nine. Did that movie make her a megastar, though? What, Legally Blonde? Yeah, Movie's wasn't fucking... she pretty much rising the uh, ladder anyway? With, she was kind of uh, rising the ladder anyway, but this is like her first like major hit. Uh, yeah, like, this movie made uh, almost a hundred million dollars in the box office domestically. Like that's pretty decent for two thousand one. You know, she's uh, she would she was already in a few like smaller films. She was in a, a horror movie called Fear with Mark Wahlberg. Prior to this, when she was like a teenage actress, wasn't she? Well, then, she was in Cruel was Intentions. Cruel Intentions. Prior yeah. to this, but this is like the one that and made her she did, um, return to Lonesome Dove miniseries. Yeah, but this is like in all those movies, though she yeah. was like a supporting character. This is like the yep. movie that made her a top the star. Yeah, yeah she's she, a, she, she became a okay. star after this. Uh, the next one, I don't know. Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean from 1972. Paul Newman. Paul, Paul Newman. Don't know this one. In Vinegaroon, Texas, former outlaw Roy, Roy Bean appoints himself the judge for the region and dispenses his brand of justice. Okay. One of Mike's favorite actors is the number eight liar liar with Jim Carrey. <laughs> Moving on. It's a funny movie. It's actually a pretty good movie. Uh, he's a pathological liar and a lawyer, but finds his career turned upside down when he inexplicably cannot physically lie for 24 whole hours. And it's kind of funny to see him try to, like, you know, defend people in court when he can't lie for them. The next one, I feel, is like an, a very underseen film. And it's interesting because it stars Vin Diesel. <laughs> Peter Dinklage. <laughs> this movie is called Find Me Guilty. Uh, it's based on a true story of a low-level gangster who defends himself in court. Uh, Vin Diesel stars as the gangster Jackie Dinascorcio. In the late 80s, he defended himself in court in what became the longest criminal trial in American judicial history. Uh, he's defending himself. Peter Dinklage is like his co-counsel. Uh, it's directed by Sidley Lumet. 
Vin Diesel actually gained weight for the role to make himself look like the schlubby, like older, like gangster character. He has hair in the film, which is kind of odd. <laughs> Uh, it's a different role for him, and he's actually pretty good in it. It's it's it's, a, it's actually a pretty good movie. Um, the trial, I think, ended up going for almost like two years or something. <laughs> and you know that the, the jury was sequestered that whole time. It's it's pretty crazy. Uh, hey, that's why you don't want jury duty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't want federal jury duty at least. Uh, Chicago number six. Um. Movie musical won Best Picture in 2003. Stars Renee Zellweger, Catherine Zeta Jones, Richard Gere, Tate Diggs, uh, Queen Latifah, Don C. Riley. It's a pretty entertaining film. If you're if you're somebody who likes musicals, it's it's it's, it's not it's, as good as Richard Gere was in his other lawyer role. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he's you know? much better in Primal Fear. Uh, <laughs> but he is still he's still pretty good in this film too. <laughs> I didn't know he could sing, so you know, kind of that kind of comes out in his in this. Uh, Catherine Zeta Jones won uh, Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for this film. It won Best Picture. Um, mm-hmm. It's a good movie. Adam's Rib, number five, nineteen forty nine, starring Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn. Uh, very old film that I have not seen. I have heard of it. Um, I know it's pretty beloved in the circles of people who have seen the film but i have not seen it domestic and professional tensions mount when a husband and wife work as opposing lawyers in a case involving a woman who shot her husband you can see it could be funny just by yeah. the just reading that and looking at like you know you got tracy and hepburn you know who were who great together on film anyway and they're grabbing a very small pair of pants <laughs> yes for some reason yeah because <laughs> both of them want to wear the pants yeah uh, for my money, number four should be number one. <laughs> but I can okay, see why some of the other ones. On this list since it was on the other list. But... Yeah, right. Mayor Go on 34th Street is number two on this list. So it's apparently a comedy and a drama. <laughs> uh, but number four on the list is My Cousin Vinny. Uh, shouldn't be on the drama list. Shouldn't be on the drama list. Definitely on the comedy list. Should be higher. I think this is number one. I love My Cousin Vinny. I think it's a, a very funny movie. I think it still holds up today. Uh, Oscar-winning performance from Marissa Tomei. Uh, Fred Gwynn, who best known as Herman Munster, as the judge in a, in a really funny role. Joe Pesci at his Pesciest. <laughs> <laughs> he had just come off his Oscar win for Goodfellas when he did this film. Yeah, uh, I love this movie. Two New Yorkers accused of murder in a rural Alabama town while on their way back from college call in the help of one of their cousins, a loudmouth lawyer with no trial experience. I think my favorite scene is when he goes to visit him in the jail cell for the first time. And Ralph Macchio plays his cousin is sleeping and the other guy is waiting for somebody to come to the jail cell and try to rape him. And he doesn't know that Joe Pesci's the lawyer yet and he thinks he's there to rape him. It's like, he's like, I'm doing you a favor. And he's like, you're doing me a favor? <laughs> Listen, buddy, one way or another, you're fucked. <laughs> you're getting fucked. <laughs> it's so funny. That and my other favorite line in the film is, uh, will the counsel like to make his his, uh, his uh, plea for the jury? And he walks up to the jury box and he goes, everything that the prosecution just said is bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. bullshit. Plus you have the uh, the ever famous, my biological clock is ticking like this. <laughs> my cousin of many should be number one. Number three is another uh, classic 1936. I have seen this one, even though this is a really old one. Mr. Deeds goes to town. An unassuming greeting card poet from a small town in Vermont heads to New York City upon inheriting a massive fortune and immediately is hounded by those who wish to take advantage of him. Uh, again, the courtroom part of this is like a smaller part. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, and I don't know. It, most people out there who are not familiar with this film may be at least familiar with the remake that Adam Sandler made called Mr. Deeds. <laughs> um, no. Not I'm as not. not as good as the original Gary Cooper one. <laughs> Gary Cooper. Cooper, the Cooper. And number one on this list. Matter of life and death from 1946. The British wartime aviator who cheats death must argue for his life before a celestial court 
hoping to prolong his fledgling romance with an American girl. So it's kind of like defending your life. The, mm-hmm. that, that movie that I talked about on Movies of Time Forgot, uh, yep. where he has to defend himself in heaven in order to go to heaven yep. or have to relive his life. In this case, Michael Powell is defending uh, that he needs to go back to Earth because of this uh, romance that he has with this American girl. Uh, I don't know much about this. Michael the director. You mean David Nevin? David Nevin. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was looking at the wrong thing. David (laughs) Nevin is the star. I don't know much about this film either. It's another one that's a little, little bit on the older end for me. I'm I'm really busy trying to get caught up with these Oscar winners. I don't have time to go back to the 30s and 40s. I hear you. Now, I hear you. Know? <laughs> Can I say there's a, uh, and I don't recall this being on the original list, but there's one that's kind of not in there that I feel should have been in there, and that mm-hmm. was The Client. The Susan Klein. Sarandon. Yeah, and, Susan yeah. Sarandon, Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. Yeah, Uh-oh. like that, that one's that probably should have been on the drama list as well. That's another Grisham one. Yeah. Yeah, The Client. So I have an honorable mention here. Uh, it was on the drama list, but I skipped it because I wanted to save it for my last category. Honorable mention for the most batshit crazy law movie of all time. That movie is The Devil's Advocate, starring Al Pacino and Keanu Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is about as batshit crazy as batshit crazy can be. <laughs> It is an exceptionally adept Florida lawyer is offered a job at a high-end New York City law firm with a high-end boss, the biggest opportunity in his career to date. What that description from IMDb is is lacking is the fact that his boss, Al Pacino, the character's name is John Milton, which is a hint. John Milton wrote the book Paradise Lost, that he is the devil. The devil owns this law firm and has recruited Keanu Reeves' lawyer character to be a lawyer at his firm, only to reveal to him at the end that he is actually the devil's son, and he brought him along to help him birth the Antichrist. (laughs) Yes. All of that is in that film. (laughs) (laughs) This movie is Al Pacino at his Al pacino yest. You thought the uh, she's got a great ass, and you got your head way up at line is over the top from heat. This whole <laughs> fucking movie is over the top. <laughs> it also co-stars Charlize Theron, Vanity. another early role definitely for her. My favorite sin. Yeah, Vanity, definitely one of my favorite sins. Connie Nielsen's in this. Jeffrey Jones, Craig T. Nelson. Uh, I mean, it's I can't say enough about how fucking crazy this movie is. I love it. <laughs> What are you? Oh, I have so many names. <laughs> Call me dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I'm trying to think of some other shit he says. There's so many fucking things he says that are, that are over the top in this film. There's a scene where he's on a, they're on a subway train and they're getting harassed by this, uh, like, uh, uh, gangbanger guy. And he starts mm-hmm. speaking to the guy in Spanish about how his wife's at home cheating on him right now. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh. <laughs> Who in their right mind, Kevin, could possibly deny the 20th century was entirely mine? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could do it, uh, Al Pacino. Cause <laughs> <laughs> what about love? Freedom, baby, <laughs> is never just having to say you're sorry. The worst vice is advice. <laughs> love is overrated. Biochemically no different than eating large quantities of chocolate. <laughs> fucking movie's nuts. Oh, you Mike. Like a bag of fucking bricks. All you gotta do is set it down. <laughs> Mike, give me beer trivia history for us this evening. I got some beer history for you. You're gonna <laughs> love this one, guys. In 1620, pilgrims abo- aboard the Mayflower were forced to land at Plymouth Rock due to their, their diminishing beer supplies. One passenger, William Bradford, complained that he and other passengers were hastened to shore and made to drink water that the seamen might have more beer to drink. I saved the beer. For the, sea, for the sailors, <laughs> yeah. Get off my ship. We're drinking the goddamn beer. That's right. Seamen need beer. That's how they fought the scurvy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's revisit our drinks for this evening. Um, 
I was drinking a tequila mockingbird uh, uh, margarita. Margaritas are always good, so I'm not going to complain too much about it. Mike had a mint julep. Very tasty. And your second one was a whiskey, whiskey sour. sour. Okay. Double. How, how you feeling? I feel good. <laughs> I'm not feeling too many aches and pains at the moment. That's for yeah, sure. That's good. And Kev, you had? I had the cream ale from um, Two Silos, which my wife brought. It was okay. It was a little light. You know, could have dealing with uh, heavier flavor, like I'm tasting in the uh, Victory Coffee Cake Ale. Um, it's a little heavy. Uh, but it's okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for episode 137. You can handle the booze as we talked about some of our uh, some courtroom films. Uh, we hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as so much as we enjoyed recording it for you. Don't forget, you can email us at filmsandfermentation at gmail.com or go to linktree.com slash filmsandfermentation. To find all of our social media podcast links, you can also go to deluxeeditionnetwork.com to find out more about our podcast and the other podcasts that belong to the Deluxe Edition Network. The Den. Support us by going to Patreon or buying our merchandise at teespring.com. Uh, remember, you can always uh, uh, like, download, subscribe to our show. We are on all podcast platforms, including Spotify, Good Pods, Apple Pods, etc. Uh, we really would like some more of those subscribes and downloads out there if you can, you know, help us out. Uh, don't forget to stop by the crossroads between pickled and fermented next time around for episode 138. Episode 138 is titled, and now for something completely different. It's going to be a deep dive into Monty Python's Flying Circus. I'm Leo. Kevin. I'm Mike. You've been listening to Films and Fermentation Podcast. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.